To get out of the current slump, we need investments into the digitalization of Germany, investments into the education system of Germany, and investments in the public infrastructure. And to do these investments, um, you have to decide how to finance them. Three years of a three-party rule is over. Germany has been led by a three-party agreement nicknamed the Traffic Light Coalition based on the parties involved. The red Social Democrats, the yellow business-friendly Free Democrats, and of course, the Green Party. It was always a fragile coalition due to the party's very different approaches. And now, German yeah. Chancellor Olaf Scholz has dismissed his finance minister, and Germany is without a majority government and is heading towards elections. The underlying reason for this divorce? Well, like a lot of marriages, it's finances. Alexander Kritikos joins us now. He's executive board member for the German Institute for Economic Research. Uh, Alexander, the FDP's Christian Lindner is set to get his certificate of dismissal from President Steinmeier. Three remaining ministers of the FDP also resigned. What eventually drove them out? Well, uh, by the way, one minister remained there and left the party. This is the newest uh, development. But indeed, what left, what made them leave was a double disagreement. Um, on the one hand, um, Chancellor Scholz wanted to raise debt and uh, Christian Linder has connected his political life with no further debts. That was the one hand, uh, um, something which was obviously not to be solved in this coalition. And the other one was really different kind of approaches, how to solve the current economic crisis in Germany. Um, where Christian Lindner's uh, Free Democrats were more in this direction. We have troubles with overregulation, over bureaucracy, and we have to do something in this direction. And while um, the, the approach of the SPD and the Greens was more in this direction, okay, let's give uh, some transfers to the larger uh, companies in Germany so that they can uh, survive this difficult uh, situation. So two really different approaches. Yeah, we've spoken a bit about this debt break. It was the FDP's strict refusal to increase the federal debt. Uh, here's what the former finance minister had to say about it after he had been dismissed. Olaf Scholz had Unfortunately, Olaf Scholz has shown that he doesn't have the strength to give our country a new boost. Instead, this afternoon, the chancellor gave me an ultimatum to suspend the constitutional debt break. I couldn't do that because I would have been breaking my oath of office. Alexander Kritikos, how helpful is the FDP's refusal, refusal to budge on this issue? Well, um, I wouldn't go so far to blame all faults on FDP because um, um, the, there is a, a two-sided issue currently. Um, I think definitely it is, uh, it's time to, to talk about the debt break, but if you do this, you also have to discuss what to do with money raised by debt. And the suggestions which were done by, uh, by uh, Olaf Scholz and the Greens was more uh, using this money to make transfers, basically keeping a structure alive, which is not uh, not really uh, viable. Um, I believe it would have been better if, uh, if the discussion would have headed in the direction, if you break up with the debt break, then we need to make investments into certain direction on which we all three agree. And it didn't reach this, uh, this kind of, of discussion. So um, basically we have to come down to the conclusion two sides were sticking too much to their own positions without trying to find a, a let's say, moderated solution which really would help the country, which really would also have both sides, all three sides. Um, this is a, a three-folded um, breakup of the coalition. This has been a kind of simmering question for a while now, but it really all kicked off last Friday when a draft economic program from the FDP was leaked, and it included many items that were at odds with the coalition's 
economic priorities. Now let's take a look at the main ideas the FDP is positing in that paper from Friday, aimed to facilitate a so-called Wirtschaftswende or German economic rebound. The party asked for a solidarity tax to be lowered from 5.5 to 3 percent. Now this tax has been in effect since the German reunification in 1990. It was meant to help the former East catch up to the West faster, but it was also meant to be temporary. Now the party also asked for corporate taxes to be lowered by two percentage points, also for air traffic taxes and fees to be reduced. They're among the highest worldwide, but they have been put in place on purpose, meant to discourage people from flying and to help Germany meet its climate goals. Now, Alexander, were these the main sticking points or what do you see as the main reason for the government's divorce here? Certainly, this is one part of the sticking points because uh, the, the parts you mentioned is are indeed those where one easily can say, these are parts which the free democrats do in order to uh, offer something to their clientele as much as Olaf Scholz um, and uh, and the Green Party have different clientele and want to offer them different uh, advantages. Um, I think there is one more part in this paper which deserves much more attention, and which also was not well solved in the in the in the proposal by Christian Lindner, namely the issue which is currently raised most often by all kinds of companies in Germany, namely a double issue around overregulation and the very bad quality of public administration of the bureaucracy. Um, Christian Lindner there proposed to have a stop in in any further regulation. I don't think this is a good idea. Uh, because that means that politics stop to exist if you do not have any further any further laws. What he missed, but what is somehow implicitly included here, is the following point. If we want to address this crucial point of Germany, which is really currently the one most pressing point, we really need not only to think about how to solve the regulatory point, we much more need to think about what to, to do with bureaucracy in Germany. The quality of governments and of public administration in Germany is very bad, or not, or at least bad. And currently we see that they are overwhelmed with all these new laws. They are not able to, to, to implement these laws in an efficient and fast and speedy manner. We really need to, to see this issue because I, don't, I think currently there is no one day where not one company, one uh, um, one of the uh, of of the companies, um, um, uh, uh, the companies, how do you say, uh, uh, confederations are not raising this point. So this point needs to be addressed. And currently we only see kind of helpless answers from politics, not getting clear that bureaucracy is currently the biggest issue which we have in Germany. Yeah, bureaucracy often named by trade groups and different industry coalitions as an issue here in Germany. But switching quickly to, to the politics here, it seems like the Social Democrats and the Greens are now effectively leading a minority government. But what does that mean for any economic agenda? Because there does seem to be a crisis facing Germany at the moment. I mean, this means that um, what has the, this three-party coalition has been uh, uh, agreed on before the Ukraine war, and which was, by the way, never adjusted. This was maybe one of the biggest faults of this uh, three-party coalition, not to adjust the program to the new circumstances. What we will see now is that uh, these two parties will try to pass through parliament as many as these um, agreed laws uh, within the next two months, and then we have to see whether Parliament will agree to this. Uh, on the one hand, it's the support for the Ukraine. On the other hand, it's also still the question um, how to move on with a big um, transformation process in the energy sector. Um, we will see to what extent they will be able to convince the Parliament to agree to some of these suggestions, but I'm pretty sure what we also will see is when um, Chancellor Scholz will ask for trust, the so-called Vertrauensfrage uh, in Parliament in January, that I'm pretty sure that we will go towards new uh, elections uh, in March. And this government will not pass many more uh, of its plans through Parliament. Now, a new finance minister has been named, Jörg Kukies. What can he really do at this point, though? I think he's just a uh, a, a person in transition. Um, he will have 
the one important task to make sure that next year there is kind of a budget. Uh, the, passing the budgetary law for next year is still an open question. And um, he will have um, really one big task to make sure that this is somehow, that this issue is somehow solved so that we have a budget next year, at least a part by, partly supported budget by the parliament. We've spoken uh, about the debt break, basically this refusal for Mr. Lindner to acquire any more debt for Germany. Uh, and on a zoomed in level, this recent fight within the coalition was this over this approximately 13 and a half billion euro hole in what was next year's proposed budget. But let's compare that for a moment, uh, the German 2025 budget hole to other top economies. The budget deficit for next year is much smaller than these other economies, the top three major economies in the world. And I should note that the China figures are projected about by the IMF. Uh, and then let's also look over at the jet debt to GDP ratio for these four countries. Germany has the lowest debt to GDP ratio of the top economies. So there does seem to be a lot of headroom for the German economy to invest and grow. Alexander, what's going on here? Why isn't Germany borrowing to invest more in its future? <laughs> That's a good question. I mean, um, there are many economists, um, I would include myself here, saying um, we need to release the, this uh, budget, uh, this, def, this debt break, um, in order to make investments. The big question is indeed whether Germany has um, the ability to agree what investments should be done. First of all, I would raise here three points at the minimum. We need to start uh, investing much more again in education. Our education system has been going down over the last years. We need, secondly, to invest tremendous amounts of money into digitalization. The German status quo of digitalization is, when we compare with other EU countries and with the EU average, it's almost tragic, I would say. And there is also an increasing uh, topic around our non-digital, so our, our, our local infrastructure, be it bridges, be it schools, be it the Deutsche Bahn, they all need investments. And we know there are three ways of financing this. Increasing taxes, which is probably not a viable solution in Germany, uh, given we have relatively high taxes. Secondly, um, decreasing uh, consumption spending by the by the government, which has to be decided if one wants to go that way, or indeed public debt. Um, there is no doubt these investments have to be done. Um, I don't see currently how um, public spending for consumption can be reduced. This would need another, this would, uh, in order to be able to do this, we would need to have another huge discussion. Um, namely, how to finance in particular our pension system. So this is currently our biggest issue in Germany. Uh, we have a huge democratic problem, demographic problem, um, meaning more people are going into pension than new people coming into the labor market, and which can only be addressed if we become an open economy towards migration, towards labor migration to Germany, and where we have to become attractive uh, uh, make German attractive uh, for labor migrants from even outside of Europe. I don't see this current discussion currently being on a good way. So I don't see how we can really uh, solve the pension system issues uh, because um, it would mean that we would need a net influx of labor migrants of 300 to 400,000 every year. Um, currently, we don't we don't uh, have any projection in this direction, which means the only way left to finance these investments is public debt. Now, this collapse of the traffic light coalition here in Europe's biggest economy comes as the world's largest economy also sees political upheaval related to financial concerns. Voters in the U.S. this week deciding to send former President Donald Trump back to the White House. Uh, Alexander, in broad strokes, what does a second Trump administration mean for the German economy? Well, it's currently... Uh, two threats which we have to face. The one thing is relatively clearly to be defined. Um, Trump has announced that uh, tariffs will be increased and the German economy who is currently already facing some issues in exports and America has been 
likely the most important, uh, most stable export country for Germany, this is bad news for German uh, exporters indeed. So if tariffs are increased, this means that the one country which was currently stabilizing the current the German economy through uh, exports in this direction is threatening Germany in the direction that we have to probably see less exports uh, towards the US if tariffs are increased. The other thing is um, less clear. Um, together with uh, the last Trump administration, we saw many insecurities um, and, and we know that if people do not feel sure what will happen in the future, they are becoming reluctant to make investments. So this kind of insecurity, which is a general feeling, a psychological feeling, might also impact Germany in the direction that investments will be reduced in Germany until things become somehow clearer. What is certainly also to be expected is that German firms will start again, produce more in the US to, to circumvent, so to say, tariffs, produce there and, and create jobs there, which also means that certainly uh, jobs are also under threat in Germany. One of Donald Trump's favorite policy tools is, of course, something you've already mentioned, tariffs. And Germany and the U.S. have a tight trade relationship. As you can see here, Germany is sending 9.9 percent of its trade to the United States. Now, Alexander, what German industries are most exposed to potential U.S. tariffs uh, that have been uh, potentially 10 percent on all foreign goods? Now, certainly there is um, as the all manufacturing sector, automobile industry, first place, but uh, general, the manufacturing sector is the one um, way where Germany is heavily depending on various areas, uh, be it medicine, be it pharmaceuticals, but it is ba basically machinery and, and, uh, and automobiles, which will be hit by tariffs in the future, probably. Now, there were some whispers that a Trump victory would put pressure on the coalition to stay together, but that didn't really happen. Uh, were the domestic pressures here, especially around the economy, just too great? Um, I'm afraid that they simply decided independently of this election, probably already before the election had been done, uh, separately that they pose in this uh, coalition, even in yesterday, they make they make positions which are not anymore, uh, which cannot be moderated anymore away. It was relatively obvious that uh, as well, Chancellor Scholz, as well as Christian Lindler were more or less ready to break up this coalition. And it is from my point, more than a pity, I would say, from the political point of view, a wrong decision not to be able to adjust the, to this election outcome and um, argue in the direction, okay, given this election outcome in the US, we really need to uh, put hands together again and try once more to find a solution to the, to the uh, German issues which we have in the current government so that we have a government until the next election, which is somehow working and which is somehow be able to also create a credible voice in European meetings. So currently, Chancellor Scholz is in Budapest. Um, he has now, he's a, a, what we, what you call in the US or what in the US is called a lame duck. Um, he has much less power now to, to create a strong European answer to US uh, compared to what he could have done if he had a, a, a support from the full government. Um, and had been traveling to Budapest with, so to say, a, a living government. You mentioned politically uh, what this could mean, but economically, does this reformation of the government, uh, does it broaden the options available for an economic turnaround or does it actually limit the options on the table? I would say currently um, we really have to wait for the next elections and then we will see whether the new government will be able to address these issues which have come up over the last two years. Um, we certainly have to decide or the next government has to decide on three things. On the one thing, the investments which I mentioned before, digitalization, education and, uh, and the infrastructure on the one hand. On the other hand, it has to address uh, the major issues which are raised by, by companies and firms, namely 
overregulation bureaucracy and it has to rethink the transformation process of the energy transformation. Currently, this was heavily um, guided by by rules, by um, by public uh, limitations, and less by the market. Um, I think this transition process can be much more um, uh, or much better, much more efficiently be run by uh, by using the typical market instruments which we have by creating taxes and prices for for uh, so to say. Uh, brown energy in order to make it more expensive related to renewable energies. Um, and this has to be also rethought by the next government in order to address the current uh, crisis, which we see here in Germany. Alexander Kritikos, executive board member for the German Institute for Economic Research. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.